Well, great. Thank you all so much for, for coming today. My name is Laura March, and I'm going to help um, moderate this session. I'm an instructional designer over at CTRL in Hearst Hall, and I was hoping today that uh, I'd ask all of my esteemed colleagues to introduce themselves, and then maybe if you could introduce yourself and tell us why you're interested in this session and what um, you'd like to hear us chat about. So, to my left. I'm Jim Lee, and uh, this is a great team we got here, and I love working with these people. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jennifer Horace. I'm an instructional designer for over at the Cova School of Business. And most specifically, I work on the program for the professional um, MBA. Uh, my name is Wilco Cruz. I'm with World Languages and Cultures. I run the Language Center here. And part of like, one of the dimensions of the work that I do here for American is uh, working with my faculty in the World Languages and Cultures Department uh, in instructional technology. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, I'm in the School of Education. I, I taught one online class. Uh, I, I didn't think it was my most successful <laughs> venture ever, so I'm interested in trying to learn uh, a little bit more. I mean, if I don't do a further online class, I, I suspect there's stuff that I can draw out from this session and I can use generally. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much all for, for coming here. And we really would prefer to have just a discussion. So if there's anything you're unclear about or want us to go over, or really, if you prefer not to talk about a subject and talk about something else, just let us know. We're all <laughs> very accommodating to that. Um, and if you'd like, we have a little flyer for our actual certification course that Michelle mentioned that we put on every semester. And since there's been so much, I guess, uh, it's, it's become very popular, we've started doing it twice a, a semester. And we'll see how the, I guess, yeah, that goes on, yeah, to meet that demand. Um, and this was a complete revamp of the whole certification process over the past few months. And we've been trying something different. We've been trying to like walk the walk and talk the talk, where we actually created a hybrid model uh, of a flipped classroom. And we'll maybe talk about some of those definitions and what each of us thinks of when they think of a, a hybrid or flipped or synchronous versus asynchronous classes. What we usually do is put the lectures and much of the content online for reference. And then when we come into our class time once a week, we spend our time reviewing each other's work, talking about um, just ways to step up our game <laughs> and looking at one another's uh, process and what activities we're doing together. So that's kind of what we would think a hybrid class, a hybrid flipped class would look like uh, if you would like to try that in your own in your own courses. So you do some more of the lecturing, readings, um, I guess introductions to topics online or offline in some other way. And then it, within class, focus more on discussions and maybe writing or a peer review of, of work um, and individual student concerns. So without further ado, maybe we should talk about your definitions of, of what a hybrid class is. Would you mind starting us off? 
You know, I, I had a definition, but I left it at home. <laughs> <laughs> Did anybody bring a definition of hybrids with them today? <laughs> Would you like to share yours? Uh, anybody got one in the audience? A hybrid? What's a hybrid? Well, I, I'm just thinking in terms of the way it's defined and the way education, especially higher education, is changing. Almost every classroom should be a hybrid because it's more active learning anyway. Um, so, like I said, I tried to do that before. Mixing the two, and I don't know if I have the right exact technique, but I do require that my students do work at home and then come in. But I think it's so I, when I think of the definition, I think of it as another method of active, you know, active learning, active teaching. I'm saying currently the way students are learning. Now, it, it, would you call that though a computer enhanced class versus a hybrid where you actually meet? in modes other than in the face-to-face -face classroom on campus? A computer-enhanced um, course, which everybody kind of is computer-enhanced right. now. Yeah, you can't get away from it. I think it's some difference because I think most people teach using some sort of platform, Blackboard campus, whatever it is now. So I think there's got to be one, one piece of that that separates it from just the computer. Um, <coughs> the common the piece that separates it is that certain credit hours are done online as opposed to face to face. So it's not only that you are, you know, students are doing some stuff online and then attending the same number of, of, of um, hours with the professor, but if a, say that the language course has four credits or maybe class one or one and a half or two of those credits are done completely online. Mm -hmm. So the meeting times are reduced. So it, for the computer stuff, the online stuff, does it have to be at the same time or could it be at asynchronous times? It doesn't have to because you are meeting with the professor less hours than in the past, you know, when the four credit hours were done on in class or the, the amount of time. Is a, if you have four credits, you have to meet with the students about I mean, just four or five hours per week, say that this is what it is, and then, so instead of meeting with the professor five hours a week, you meet with him or her four or three and a half. Mm -hmm. So you have two sessions instead of three or three sessions with one time. So, you know, you can measure the amount of time that is gone, has gone online. It's online teaching, and you can do it through so, you know, we've partnered with these companies, Deltac and 2U, and their hybrid, what they call a hybrid is, we'll meet online at the same time, one session a week, and we'll meet online asynchronously at another time. So they don't even have a face-to-face -face component, and they call that a hybrid course. So I guess there's some structure, some traditional element versus mm -hmm. definition-wise. Tradition, you know. And that's actually one of the really interesting things about this and what makes it so exciting and a little bit like challenging, I guess, at the same time, uh, because we all, I think, have that inclination. Of we are, most of us are very familiar with face-to-face -face teaching, and somehow we want to kind of bring that over into this new environment. And sometimes some things work, and some things just kind of work disastrously. Uh, <laughs> but nevertheless, because we are human, and we, you know, I mean, uh, there's so much for originality, but we all think and base all our decisions and things that have come before us, and we are very conditioned by what we know best. I see over and over again that you know that people are very inclined to, to, to create that. You know, so I get uh, inquiries about people wanting to see 50 students at a time while they're lecturing. You know, in a synchronous meeting, which is really, I mean, you're going to look at it one of the 50 faces. Are you expecting people to, you know, to raise their hand or be able to actually pay attention to while they're lecturing? It's not really practical in some senses, and also. Another thing that you have to think about is like for the best use of the technology, sometimes we're difficult to break down. And to, you know, we do still have a lot of constraints in terms of uh, the infrastructure itself. And sometimes you know, you're not going to have enough bandwidth to support 50 video feeds. You know, so what do you do? So I think like the exciting thing is like you know what innovative or cool ideas can you come up to actually make that work and then still make people feel engaged and 
uh, taken care of. Um, which actually kind of brings us to one of the big issues with this, which is like, you know, once you don't, you're not in the same room with somebody, how do you keep them engaged and how do you make that presence uh, sort of still uh, the, the centerpiece of, you know, the, the teaching relationship? Because I think in a lot of the research that's out there, that's one of the things that comes over and over in terms of uh, retaining students in terms of like the percentage of people who complete a course. Uh, in terms also of the experience of the teacher, <laughs> you know, how they feel about it. And it all seems to come down to people wanting to feel that contact, even though, you know, and that, that's one of the challenges. So I, I think I wanted to kind of like bounce that over to you guys for, for the ones who have had some experience and for those who don't, and what are your perceptions about how you do people engage? I think it's a, it's a very interesting, I teach mostly online now, um, and I think the I find that there's pieces of it that I absolutely love, and then there's parts of it that just drive me crazy. I think, um, without having that presence, students tend to come up with more excuses for why they can't get stuff done. And there's no <laughs> real, you know, well, I have this to do and this to do and this to do, but you know, I've set I've set mine up. This is after doing this for four years that there are deadlines. It is um, a thing for this learning, but there are. You know, specific deadlines for certain things, and it's very confusing to them how they thought that they could, you know, have this online course and work at their own pace, but then there's deadlines. So, but back to your question, what I have found is that the way to keep students engaged is I start my week Tuesday morning and give them until Monday night. And Tuesday morning, it's always good morning, this is the start of week, whatever. And then I go through the list. Come Wednesday, I send another email. And then usually by Friday, because I have um, noticed that students think I'm going to work on the weekends because they're going to work on the weekends, but I've decided that it's just not going to happen anymore. I will not check this again until Monday. So I have I do a, a beginning of the week email announcement, midweek, and then for the end of the weekend. I know you have work to do. Most of them will do their work and wait till the weekend, but I'm sorry, I will not be responding. You know, I give them sort of a few hours before I'm going to shut down and say, if there's any questions, please get them in by 4 o'clock on Friday, which is nice stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm constantly, three times a week, make purposeful announcements about my own work. Um, and that's how I, I try to keep that sense of presence. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying something new this semester, which is, I think it's the blue, blue button, blue, they have to tell blue button. Yeah. My courses run the second eight weeks, so some so I have time, but the students have to video conference um, with each other. And I can watch them, but you don't have to, but I have found that, um, and I guess between having some connection visually and then also in the very beginning of the semester, I put on, and I, I absolutely don't like recording, it's not that I hate listening to myself, but I put on that one welcome to semester. So there's a Right, that's a great strategy. Um, but as you have pointed, pointed out, and I think that we're all, and Laura can speak to that, because that has, a, I think, a big bearing on the redesign of what we're doing to reach out to faculty and do the training. It's like this whole thing about deadlines and structure. Because, you know, obviously marketing has been done a big service to online learning, because you see, and you still see those this on TV, you know, like people in their little bunny slippers and pajamas, and then say, you know, you can do this whenever you have time. People sort of translate that as, you know, 24-7, I am just going to wait until the very last possible moment to do this. And then obviously, if you're having a discussion and you have something where you need uh, a lot of feedback kind of going back and forth, it kind of like implodes the whole thing. Because mm -hmm. people are just kind of showing up on Sunday night, you know, for a discussion that should have started on Tuesday, that's not going to get you very far. And obviously, the, the outcomes are not going to be met that way. So, uh, kind of like changing that sort of perception on the part of the students is, is like, <coughs> and even in like face to face classes, because we do, um, for Spanish, which is uh, what I teach for um, language department, I, we have um, courses that are web enhanced. So they're not hybrid by any means yet, but they have a very heavy component for the first. A lot of stuff to the blackboard. And, you know, they're in a way also flipped in the sense that we don't cover the major um, content in the class. We let them sort of digest that and then come to class and spend the time basically practicing and having the music, right? Applying what, whatever, whatever they need and kind of carrying out any. Uh, misconceptions or things that they promised and have encountered with materials. So that's like the whole idea of a kid classroom that you sort of clear out face time or contact time for 
uh, practice an actual application rather than for instructional mode, right? Um, but I still have to tell them that too, you know, it's like, you know, we have deadlines and this is the reason why the deadlines are better. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, I actually wanted to take uh, a little bit of a step back too, so make sure that everybody was on the same page with what these terms are. <laughs> sure. Right. Um, you do a, a distinction between web enhanced and, and hybrid. And I, I still didn't quite get the definition of hi hybrid uh, uh, earlier on. I sense that there's more. Than, there's several definitions of hybrid. Yes. Uh, I, I, I you just bet. wonder, that in view of your distinction between web enhanced and hybrid, uh, you, you could just sort of sure. have yeah. a start So, uh, and help me along, anybody, uh, and everybody can add a little bit to this. But the continuum would be like we have face to face where we're having, let's, let's say, for example, a three, three times a week class for the weekend, three times a week. Or Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. So that would be a face to face. We meet from eight to nine mm -hmm. in this room, right? So that's kind of like a more traditional approach. Um, Let's say that we're not using Blackboard, so that we have a purely traditional, you know, you have your textbook and you show up and you I give the assignments to do, you homework and you read it and you discuss or we apply, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if we have a web enhanced uh, sort of uh, class. 0% online. Right, 0%. <laughs> right. So then we move to along the continuum, and, and this is, I guess, what causes confusion. There's no like clear cut from things, there's a whole bunch of okay. varieties, right? Um, then we have a web enhanced class, but maybe like part of the text is online, maybe like some of the workbooks are already linked up because the publisher has put on this really expensive ancillary, you know, that they want us to buy, and so we bought it and we took it off the blackboard. And so that enhances the class. <coughs> you know, maybe we have, maybe we do have included some uh, YouTube videos of uh, pertinent uh, lectures or, or things that people should see that are in there. So that would be web enhanced in that sense. Um, and that's up to about 30% is that? Per Sloan, right? Per Sloan, they say at least 30 percent, although the that university the has been reluctant to put an exact number on it because they want free thinking on campus. Right. But I think in terms of what students are looking for, if they were taking a hybrid class and they found out that one class was online and the rest face-to-face, -face, they might be a little disappointed. <laughs> right. So, so, so then you have the web hands. I was just going to add, a, so kind of the, the ranges that you'll see from Sloan would be, you know, 1 to 30 percent would be that web enhanced where you're just putting a little bit online, but your class maybe you still meets face to face, and then hybrid is 30 to, I want to say it's like 70 or 80 percent, um, turns it over to a hybrid course. Right. So that's kind of where that, and those are, those terms are per Sloan, and it's still kind of Nebulous, loose yeah. and, and, and interpreted different. Yeah. And then the upwards of 80 would be the yeah, fully online. Yeah. And so like to go back to what Nuria was mentioning before, the important thing to keep in mind here is we're talking about instructional time. So if we have these three classes where we have three hours of instructional time, if you were to make that class hybrid and let's say, you know, 30% is going to be online, right? So the Friday session, mm -hmm. it's done online somehow. That would be for you to do exercises where I'm going to send you off to the ancillary mm -hmm. session and have you work through that. It would be instructional time. So either it's going to be a lecture mm -hmm. or we're going to be together. So there's some sort of disruption coming from the, from the teacher into the classroom. So that's actually where like the division is made in terms of like, you know, what is a hybrid and what's completely a distance because we're doing a completely online distance course where everything is virtual. That instructional time, you know, you're going to put up in your syllabus where you know this class has three hours, or three contact hours, that's what they sometimes they call them, instructional hours. And so you are accounting for that, but you're actually sharing material with the students through that. And then beyond that, there's all the work in terms of exercises and projects and all that stuff that people have to do, which is the akin to what well, the traditional classes where we need three hours a week, but you know, you should set aside five hours to work on this to be successful. Okay. And just um, another note on those, like the 80% to 100% all online. So that that's a benchmark that was sent by Sloan, a, a consortium, but American University has different, I guess, definitions. So if you are teaching during a summer institute class, they're going to want all of your classes to be meeting online, so no in-person uh, requirement and asynchronous, at least for right now. There might be some um, changes in the future. Uh, and asynchronous. Mm -hmm. um, how does AU define, I mean, I know the standard definition for asynchronous, but as far as deadlines, then maybe you'll get to this. Um, but do you set it up that, or what, is there a standard that um, the work can really be done completely um, I don't want to say without deadlines, but you know, is it, 
is it very loosely defined and students are supposed to have more time and flexibility within the online course? No, no, I think it's up to you. Okay. Um, what we've definitely found in our course, though, is if we don't make deadlines and checkpoints, mm -hmm. that things just fall apart real quickly, mm -hmm. um, and that you'll be asking people for for their final work, and it won't come until weeks and weeks later. Um, yeah, I don't do that, but I, yeah. I, I learned um, <laughs> the first time I did this, I kind of had a, a automatically set up the date so each week stuff shuts down mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a great um, tool that I don't, I don't I don't know if now that you're doing doing more training that's incorporated into it but I remember when I took training on Blackboard I don't know how many years ago that wasn't necessarily part of the critical um, topic that we covered but mm -hmm. I think it's Sure, I can show you kind of what our class looks like, and again, we have this as just a model, uh, and as professors, you are empowered to do this or not. Uh, so the one thing that we did is we did make those weeks on as part of the navigation tabs. Anybody can do this, any professor that has the control over their class, uh, to edit that navigational system. And then within here, we had a pre-class, in-class, and post-class folder, which is something that Jennifer developed for the COGOD uh, school and their hybrid system. So. Um, this is week two. You can see that we are asking everybody to watch, read, and uh, do some discussion boards before class. Within class, we have some like best practices, things that we went over. Um, sometimes we'll have checklists, so when you're looking at uh, partners' work, you can say that's good or this part is should need some work, and we'll keep those somewhere. And then in the post class, we'll have uh, actual assignment due uh, and make everything pretty clear about where where things lie. So this can be done in your current classes if they're face-to-face, -to -face too. Um, Michelle, you want to share what you thought about that layout, if you'd prefer to do other other ways, or how you chose to set up your class after seeing this? Um, one of the problems with, um, one of the differences is that because and we talked about this in our class, is that teaching the other students, I teach the freshmen, you can't put everything on there. Otherwise, that would have been fantastic. Being in the class, that was that model was very useful. That it's, it's just set up pre class and class post class and you know where to go. Um what I learned from these guys is that it helps you oh it helps the students focus and they know directly where they need to be. Since um, I do have to meet twice face to face in the week and I'm trying to put more online, but I do have to keep my two face to face meetings, I set up mine uh, by topics, which puts it in the weeks. And I do have the, this is what you're going to do before class, and this is what we're going to talk about in class, and this is what you have to do for next week set up, even though it's not all online for them, but I have it set up for them where they know that's what's going to happen. Jennifer, would you want to speak more about how you developed this, and kind of that, that process here? Sure. I um, so as an instructional designer, that's my background, um, and I work specifically with the Cobalt School Business Code Program, the professional MBA program. So I work with all the faculty members who teach in the program to take their face-to-face -face course and to put it into a hybrid flip format. So ours is flipped over there. Um, and what I had developed when I started working with them, because the questions I got when I sat down with them were, how many times are we going to meet? How much time is this going to take? And just tell me exactly what I have to do. So I said, <laughs> all right, let's put it on paper. So this is going to be our roadmap, and this is how we're going to work together for the next four months to get this done. Um, so it was a professor who was very comfortable with the class that they taught face to face, right? You know it inside and out. So trying to take it and pull it apart is much easier than a new professor picking up a brand new course trying to figure out how to how to lay it out in a different mode. But this is our process we took them through. So the first thing I did is I met with them and we talked about the timeline. So I said this is gonna take four months. This isn't we're gonna sit down in one week and have this laid out. It's gonna take about four months. It's not gonna take forty hours a week for four months, but it's gonna take maybe ten hours a week over the next couple weeks to get this done. Or not even ten hours, it was probably an hour a week. But they had to keep moving on it and they had to keep working um, at it without me. We talked about the tools that we were going to use, um, and we talked about some templates. So we have a template called the course design template, which is our first big piece of where we take their face-to-face -face and we put it onto a worksheet. And the worksheet is divided up into that pre, that pre-class, in-class, and post-class. And I said, throw everything into that in-class session, right? And then we're going to start to pull out what you think you can deliver 
before the class and what maybe we could move to after the class. So we started talking about lectures could go before the class. We could record those lectures so the students could engage in discussion when they came out. We could put a couple discussion questions to, to get them thinking about the topic. So when they came into class, they were ready to really dig in and start discussing it, maybe start a group project. Um, and then we started to talk about what do they need to do after class? Is there any assignments, any reactions to after class? And some students said, or some professors would say, well, I might want them to do a quiz or I might want them to um, do another discussion or write a paper or I may not have anything for them to do. I want them to start in the next week. And so that was, up, that was left up to the instructor how they wanted to use that um, pre-class and class and post-class. And then we also assign learning outcomes to, to each one of those to make sure that we were meeting the learning outcomes for that course. Um, after that was done, then we started talking about the course material because that also drives your development. You know, some professors would use, there's so many amazing tools in the market right now. We use all digital textbooks. Well, with digital textbooks comes MyOM Lab and accounting has all these amazing tools as well. So you want to understand what's out um, on the text for, textbook world that you may want to leverage um, as well to support your course because that will drive your development. Um, and I should have said our whole process is laid out with an ADDIE model because instructional design. And you'll see what the swim lanes are analysis, design, develop, implement, and evaluate. So each one of these we had a measured income or measured outcome that moved us over to the next one. Right? So our measured outcome was for the faculty member to decide on their course material and to fill out that course design template. Once they did that, we moved down into the design piece, which is where they really took that course design template and they put it into a hybrid syllabus. So now this is where all those due dates really come into play. You know, we say, all right, you said you wanted them to do a discussion and watch a lecture, and then they're going to come into class and work on a project, and then when they leave the class, they're going to work on the presentation. What are all those due dates tied to those assignments or those tasks? And not only do the due dates have to work for the students, but I would say to the professors, think about your life. They have to work for your life as well, right? So we know we have working, and our program is geared towards working professionals. So we say, all right, we, one time we tried a Friday due date. Due date. That didn't work at all. <laughs> so then we had to go to Saturday afternoons. We have one professor that tried Saturday afternoons. Students hated that as well. So we knew we had Saturday at midnight and Sunday at midnight are our two due dates. But then that means the professor has to get that information in by Sunday at midnight. They have to dedicate their Monday to read it to be able to give them feedback by Tuesday. All right, so it makes a really, really tight deadline for the professor. And I would say, all right, can you, can you do this? Does this work for you? Does this not work for you? Because you can't give them an assignment and give them another one on top of it without giving them any feedback in between, right? So that feedback loop is really, really important. So you talked about that. You said, it's Friday night. I'm done. I'm shutting down my computer. And you know, Saturday and Sunday, I'm going to look at this stuff back on Monday. But you were very upfront with your students and you told them that's how you were going to run it, which is good. But you found out probably through yeah, the no, lessons no, that no, that's yeah. how. Yeah, that's <laughs> that was the best way to do it, right? <laughs> well, I had, yeah, I mean, I set it up Tuesday morning mm -hmm. and I wake up, I, I release the class at like Tuesday on Tuesday morning. Mm -hmm. I have all week to work on all the assignments, quizzes, whatever it is, except their first discussion board has mm -hmm. to be answered by um, I think Thursday. It's the only date, so that gives people an extra day to respond. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the only one that has a different deadline. But I give them the weekend, because I find that most students, most students, they just don't do work during the week. I have a plan you to do, but most of them leave it, and I feel like, okay, I'll, I'll let them do it over the weekend, mm -hmm. and then I've already set up the week ahead of time for Tuesday. So while they're starting their week, I have that Tuesday to grade. Um, so it gives me it gives me my free weekends where I don't feel burdened by grading papers. Mm -hmm. and I mean, I'll grade some as they come along, but I, I'd say I would get most of them, Mon most of them are still doing it Monday. Mm -hmm. So then Tuesday, it opens already. Right? There's nothing for me to really do on Tuesday except you know, release the material because that's their first. Mm -hmm. And then I have Tuesday. So I found that works best. Right, but important to have that, that loop and to yeah. figure out your timelines and not only what works for the students, we know we love our right. students, we want to take care of them, <laughs> but you also have to look into your life and figure out what will work for your life because online or hybrid can really take it over. If you oh like. yeah, we'll, we'll call on the weekend. <laughs> 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 yeah.
Okay. I just wanted to add that the challenge is maybe different uh, depending on what you're teaching. So mm -hmm. it sounds like you have like a more content-based class, you know, for people who are teaching language or other things where you need to do constant checks and they're mm -hmm. sort of um, responsible for doing multiple exercises and like the small pieces of work uh, where it's very easy to fall behind and then, you know, suddenly you have like 10 pieces that you have to do instead of like five. You know, you just kind of have to, and, uh, I think what works best is to lay down the law and I tell my students this, and like, you know, if you miss it, it's gonna close. You know, I'm not gonna accept it anymore because you're supposed to be doing this before you come to class so you can participate. So if you're not doing it, it's not gonna do you any good if you bring it, if you spend your Saturday or Sunday doing like a warrior, a weekend warrior <laughs> instead, yeah. and then you come in the next week because we're not using it anymore. So if you couldn't do it, that's fine. Just let me, you get a zero. We continue to be friends and we move on. And, <laughs> <what> <laughs> says, and that seems to work well because then they know that that's the expectation, and then you know, sometimes you like lay it down early in the semester and you give a couple zeros, which I've done, and then people fall into line. I hate to do that to them. I give them more time for like bigger pieces, like uh, compositions mm -hmm. and papers and things like that. But for the small stuff, it's you know, I just tell them it just doesn't benefit them to kind of like think that they can wait until the end of the semester to do 60 exercises, mm -hmm. which I'm not going to be looking at all the ones. Right, again, yeah. Uh, if I just ask a question about it, because I think I'm, I'm really interested in the hybrid but the flipped, as you were saying. Mm -hmm. And you were going back to the design, design stage of that. When you design it, mm -hmm. you, I, I, I'm assuming that you want most of the act design and just learning to take place while you need it. Yes. So, do you always do the same, the pre class? Is it always the lectures or? Is it independent reading? Or do you find that you always have to post lectures for pre-class, um, and then the in-class is used solely for? Share your story about so the the faculty member that wanted to review their whole lecture. I like that uh, one. But the, the students, they're like, no, we already learned this. Yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> so the faculty members, what we what we would do is uh, when they initially lay it out, they put it all in their in-class and they say, all right. So you want to talk about you know X, Y, and Z. Let's make a recorded lecture and let's put that on the outside of the classroom. And they'll say, all right, well these two chapters go with that. So and I'll say, okay, well then let's put those two chapters. So now they have a lecture they have to read or a lecture they have to watch. Um, two two chapters maybe they have to read and then maybe a discussion board just to, that ties all of them together. Mm -hmm. um, and then when the students, we want them to learn the flip pieces. What do they need to be able to do when they come to that class? And so I always say to the professor, you know, tell me what you want the students to be able to do. And they'll say, well, I want them to be able to engage in a discussion about what they read and what they watched. All right, well, let's put it on the outside of the class. Great, so now you're not taking the inside of your class to go through all the nuts and bolts of the whole discussion because they already have watched that. They've already read about it. So now they come in, they're ready to discuss it. And I'll tell you what, the students that aren't ready to discuss it, Boy, they do that one time, and that's about it. <laughs> 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 They're the only ones that can't engage in a, in a discussion in the classroom because everybody else is prepared. So it, it it works really well that way. And then if professors come in and they want to hash over their whole lecture, the students will say, "Yeah, like we've already we've already covered that. Like we're you know they've already learned that because they that was required of them before they came into the class." And what do you think about what the standard standard courses, the three credit course? Mm -hmm. What do you time-wise lecture um, give online pre-class? Um, you know, like I, so I teach block classes all day. Mm -hmm. I basically start with block classes, and I always try to you know, make my lectures pretty short. Yes. Um, and then engage in activity. But you know, what sort of and, and then this last semester is the first time I actually tried to record on the I didn't like I didn't like doing it at all. But what's sort of the standard, you know, that you would give if you have three hour block class time to cover materials, and then you're changing the flat the you know the format and the design of the class, but you have to take this up obviously you want to cover the same amount of material. What are sort of the guidelines for an online lecture that students you know will listen to? What it, Michelle? <laughs> uh, short. The most important <laughs> that five minutes or. I don't remember exactly what you guys say, but I know I decided math, mm -hmm. but I decided definitely eight minutes is probably too long, so short first. Mm -hmm. um, another really helpful thing was, like Jennifer said, the 
this is what you're going to do for class, and then actually trusting them to do it, and then I can have something completely different, like what this is what you're going to do in class. Like, great, you learned it. So let's, for me, let's do these problems. Let's take it to the next step. Like, we've got to fix it another way, which we talk about it. But the five minute short lectures are best, and I still haven't quite figured those out. Well, so what um, I've actually seen is, is pretty helpful for, for most students and actually finishing the video. They drop way off after after four, so five is pushing it. <laughs> um, is if you're going to have something that you speak for 15 minutes on, try to segment it out so it's three videos of five minutes each. To if you're you're giving if you can find ways that you would split that up even with slides. If you talk about one slide for five minutes, flip to another. Um, that's really the way to keep people interested. Or if there are better uh, better resources out there, if there's a TED Talk that can explain something or a primary resource, why not send them directly to do that? And you can do that all, if you're doing a hybrid class, you can do that all, a hybrid flip class. Oh, yeah. So you have to link them. There's, there aren't any copyright issues. You know, I, I know there were some. We can uh, hook you up with some copyright language from the, the law school. They put together a really helpful handbook. Okay, and so you can put those lectures in because they're far more interesting than what I teach. And I teach about health disparities so mm -hmm. um, minority health issues. And there's so much that's already out there that is clearly better than, you know, mm -hmm. um, me recording. And in an in-class dialogue, I feel like I can, I can do a better job for some reason. But if I you can link that to the pre-class, and that's the information I like to mix it up and so I might have a little short video but then maybe a PowerPoint with audio too and then a link to a YouTube author because I found every one of the books I used all the authors had some lecture they did on YouTube hmm. and so I like to mix it up so they don't watch my face too much and, and you to don't me. feel like when you do the hybrid and you link that students aren't Expecting everything to come from you as the original source. And our mm -hmm. our, I find that our students actually like it the more we shake it up a little bit. And there's textbooks now, Inkling has textbooks, um, digital textbooks, where they have embedded videos mm -hmm. inside of them. So it's subject matter experts talking about, um, you know, whatever their product is, you know, when we're in a marketing book. And they, I found myself, I was just previewing the book and I was like sucked in. I was like, wow, this is the best video in this hotel chain. And, I mean, it was so cool. And you know, I don't think the students are looking for the professor to have every single thing because there's so much knowledge and information out there, um, but just finding the right best thing to use. And so how much would you say pre-class materials? I think you mentioned that the time that pre in the pre-class are the lectures that are online versus the time spent in class. So oh, so like so the guidelines. I give the, to the professional yeah. MBA um, faculty members. Ours are also condensed courses, so everything's kind of taught in like a summer school. Mm -hmm. That's been seven weeks, and that's the longest course. But we give them, um, it's called, we say 10 to 12 hours of work per week. Three of those hours are in class, so seven to nine outside of class is our gauge. So whether it's how many hours they put in their pre class or post class is fine, but they can't really go over the seven to nine hours of work outside of the class. Does that make sense? And that includes watching all those lectures, reading all those chapters. That includes learning and the homework. Yeah. And that's a great kind of like, it's very easy to use, but it's like one of the sort of like tables and things to have in mind when you start the design. Mm -hmm. Because you know, sometimes people ask, well, how much material do I need? So then you depart from that formula. So if, like, this is what, you know, these four credits or these three credits mean, then you can mm -hmm. certainly go and choose. And if you have a lot of materials to choose from, then you know, well, you know, we only have this amount of time, so I'm going to choose this, this, and this. So it makes your job with the designer a lot easier, I think, as well. And actually, what they did as well, um, we had, in the top of the class, we had, this is what you're going to do before class. And by the way, if you want to read more, here's this other section of stuff that you can always go back and look through on your own. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Uh, when, uh, how would you modify what you just said in relate, uh, with regard to level? students, but also um, the difficulty of uh, concepts that you know there might be preconceptions about. In other words, uh, uh, and, and this is new for me, I'm a new adjunct here, so mm -hmm. hi. Hello. <laughs> uh, 
there are, uh, the last time I taught, I used a slide machine. You know, the thing that goes around on the carousel. Mm -hmm. That gives you an idea. We've got some new technology. Oh, <laughs> we got well, I actually have a flash drive. Yeah. Thing, but I, I don't <laughs> own a laptop, but uh, that's okay. Because okay, I've got lots of surprises. And I can still use the chalkboard and surprise So, But anyway, uh, yeah, if you're, if you're dealing with concepts, that uh, things that, at least in your own mind, you believe to be difficult and you don't want people to regurgitate for them to own them, mm -hmm. uh, which is a little bit different than simply memorizing something. If you teach health disparities, there's a whole world that you, you can have people regurgitate stuff. doesn't mean they really do. You know, mm -hmm. There's a problem. So I, I, I just wonder, how, how would you modulate? You talk about 12 hours. Uh, I like that formula, three hours of working seven hours of I work outside. Uh, but I could see that going different ways. I mean, I could see you spending a whole two sessions to drill down on certain types of concepts, uh, concepts especially that relate to human difference that people think they know. That they brought a lot of that into it. And they can read all they want on the outside and it's not going to be anywhere because of what they get. So anyway, I just want to comment. I just want to um, my what I've taught online is contemporary art, which is filled with all of that and filled with a oh, lot yeah, of opinions. Yeah. <laughs> um, and also, you know, creating the artwork is a scary moment for a lot of a lot of people. Um, but a lot of those technologies can really enhance because you can have them be anonymous. So when you're delving into certain things that deal with opinions or like deep beliefs, and students don't want to necessarily uh, have their name attached to something that they want to discuss just click the make anonymous post uh, instead of uh, raising your hand and having a room full of strangers think know that you think di differently than they do and kind of setting that up on what a discussion looks like what a safe space looks like and what's acceptable and not and especially making sure that you're following your own rules and giving the that feedback I think it's really a, a so great boom. Uh, you can do it on Blackboard. You can do it on um, most learning management systems. Have an anonymous option. Yeah. <laughs> or you can even. Um, I like to take things into the personal. So it's like sharing an experience in which you had uh, something that you might not want to share in front of people in a live audience session um, so that people know that they're dealing with, that they're interacting with people that are affected by contemporary issues. Any other thoughts? In your class. Well, I'm thinking more about making them work harder on this definition of hybrids. <laughs> sure. Because <laughs> the other question I was going to ask you is, when we do the face-to-face -face part of a hybrid course, we've already established it could be online or face-to-face, -face, it could be synchronous or asynchronous. Does the face-to-face -face part have to be at AU? Could be at the courthouse. Those are <laughs> for us. No, no. For us, for our department, yes. I don't think that's any option. But they've had like some summer study abroad programs where they take a group of students to Costa Rica. <laughs> for three weeks and then they come back and have four weeks of instruction online. And I guess where I'm getting at with these definitions now when you put together these like a kaleidoscope of where you are, what time you are, are you face to face, are you online, and you turn this Rubik's Cube around, there are so many possibilities with hybrids that I think the traditional model that we kind of grew up with that, all right, we're doing it face to face, now we're doing it online, has been blown apart. Do you have to alternate between face-to-face -face and online? No, you can do four face-to-face, -face, three online, then two face-to-face, -face, and you can shake it up. Uh, you could do it in a way that some faculty have at AU where they do alternate week to week and they have another professor who uses the classroom the week that you're out online. And departments love that because they save <laughs> a classroom space and can put more faculty in there. Um, and we talked earlier about what makes your definition of a hybrid. It could be anywhere from 30 to 70. Hybrids are so much more interesting than online because there's so many possibilities. Mm -hmm. There's also some models where people check in person in the semester that we work online and then you get together for the final projects. The hard part is, and I know Laura wants to talk about this later, is how do you decide what works best online versus face-to-face? 
Yeah, let's actually make that a question for everybody. Do okay. you want to share your thoughts, or should we throw it over to them first? Well, I know, you know, you and I have talked about this concept of comparative advantage. Mm -hmm. That, you know, just some, you know, things like if you're doing a simulation, it works so much better face-to-face -face than doing something online, especially if it's asynchronous and it gets kind of discontinuous in, in terms of conversations. But uh, you have to sort of lay out your game plan for a hybrid course and have some good reasons why you're doing something face-to-face -face versus online. And that's the hardest part about starting with a hybrid course, I think. Hmm. Other ideas on that? Comparative advantage? My opinion is that it's very difficult to generalize as we are to really good people because I'm just thinking about the different disciplines that I know very I think you're right that I think a lot of universities, including our own, think that online is a panacea or a solution to everything. And I get so annoyed with these Comcast commercials where kids are saying, I couldn't learn without the internet and high speed internet. I just couldn't learn. And I think, well, geez, uh, somehow people learned uh, before. And, you know, in the old days, in, in this country, before there was Yale University, which I think was the first university or college in the United States, there were online and hybrid courses. That's how people got educated. What they would do for an online course is they would write a paper, put it on a boat that would take it back to England to their professor who would grade it, and three months later they'd get assignments back. Now, I'm sure t students today could not wait three months for their assignment, <laughs> but they would also do hybrid modes where they might go over for a year and work with the professor and come back and write a longer piece. So hybrids and online, this is 300 years old. It's not new. The technology has changed, but these basic concepts and pedagogy, which is why we've structured the course like we have, is still the key. But I think people are rushing to this, and, and you've seen what's happened with MOOCs. Ah, oh, MOOC, 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 MOOC. Now, well, wait a minute. MOOC, uh, you know, you're getting about a 1% graduation rate, and you're not retaining a lot of students, and they're spending $40,000 her instructors to put on these classes that hardly anybody finishes. Uh, I think they're just you know, like kids with hammers and, you know, they're beating on everything. I think you're asking about our perceptions of relative advantages and disadvantages of the online versus the live uh, class. Uh, I can certainly see the advantages of the online activities in terms of broadening the 
approach, etc. I think one of the advantages of the uh, interaction, the sort of live interaction, and I suppose that could be online as well as face face to face, uh, is that it does allow you more opportunity to probe and press and push. It's like getting that depth of, uh, of uh, exploring a deeper conceptual understanding of the subject matter. Uh, for me, uh, collaborative dialogue in the classroom offers huge advantages uh, for, for that purpose, sort of Socratic questioning, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so, yeah, at the end of the day, you know, th there's definitely a need for both uh, and, and the live interaction uh, does seem to be really important. Uh, I know you could do that synchronous online. Uh, I'm always a bit scared about the technology and, uh, uh, and the doing it on screen with a class of 30. <laughs> that, that seems to me cha pretty challenging. And, uh, but anyway, that, that's my thinking about it. The, the, the live interactive bit for me is, is what makes the, the, the classroom and, and the, the learning experience. Mm -hmm. Do you want to share your experience with the discussion board? Because uh, so when we started this project with Summer on course, um, I, you had a very different view of how this was going to run out. She was very concerned because it's the content course that there will be enough yeah. to the course and how certain components of these things were going to translate into online. And, and the other station was also that it was a completely distance course, so they will never be physically with her in the same room, so there was a lot of hesitation because of this. But we, we found something surprising about the 2013 summer. Yeah, I so remember that course went very well. I don't know, I think the first year there wasn't still that kind of bursting of online courses. This year, 13 people signed for the course, the same as last year. And when they saw the syllabus and what they didn't find, it went out to end. <laughs> and when we started, it went out to so I said, wow, mm -hmm. it was good news to me in, in the sense that <laughs> <laughs> it told me that that was exactly what I wanted to do with the The effect of it was better to say. But on the other hand, it questioned so many things because of course we are offering a class that has 13 people, has signed in, and the proper time you are with is five. So the first year with the 13, the, you know, the participation was amazing, was huge. Because what I did, I just translated as that is somebody who has no, you know, me, somebody who doesn't even have Facebook. So it's not that I'm against this, look, I have my smartphone and all of this, but I'm, I, I'm not somebody who's very comfortable with all this stuff, and I would still read and print if I can manage, you know, a point of um, reading in uh, digital. But that's me. So when I was asked if I like to, you know, put this uh, in course on my side, I said, wow, this is a big challenge, really one. So I did <coughs> the same kind of a structure we would have in class, meeting two hours per week, and just doing the same kind of, you know, assignments, participation, readings, and then discussions on what the class discussion, everything was too slow. Everything was transferred to the, the discussion, you know, um, online. And it was amazing. It was really amazing. But what I was amazing? Spent 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> I was just overwhelmed because everybody was squeezing there. It was so packed that course, but it went really well. Yes. And that's a generic 200. But they have, uh, yeah, but it, it's, it's very it's a demanding course. I mean, they, they, they have text from the colonial times, 19th century, 20th century. I mean, you either, you either get an edge and you get completely. And the challenge is also like a generally like a 14 or I mean a, a regular semester course has been kind of compressed into a summer course. So that's, you're still covering was, the same You couldn't do without less than 15 hours a I had a week. Yeah. There was no way you could do it. And that's one of the challenges I think like, that you were saying is that you never know what you're going to get in terms of like the student population. And that's one of the big concerns right now for you know, distance courses all over the country. And so some of the schools, what they're doing is they're actually giving out these questionnaires to kind of see how you perceive yourself and whether you are a good candidate to actually do this because it's not for everything. You're not self-motivated and you can, you know, 
stick to deadlines, you're going to have issues, you're going to have problems, and probably you won't complete. So mm, that's a big concern right now. Like, how do you get a good instrument that will give you a good indication of how somebody's going to perform in one piece? Because obviously, right now, it's like they give you like a list of, like, I am good at adhering to deadlines. I am, you know, obviously, people are going to choose what they think that, they, that you want them to mm -hmm. say. So that's actually where the research is going now, kind of like trying to figure out how do we know that, you know, what's next, what you're seeing, are going to be the good candidate, for instance, actually going to be doing a service uh, rather than not. So I even came off these hours, so I did Skype with them. So it was, and, you know, the, when the class was um, face to face, it was Brian Tuesday and Thursday, so I had the same structure. So they had modules that were, mm -hmm. they had to open on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and things were, it, it was open, it was released from the very beginning, but more stage to it, which is from the beginning. <coughs> you have deadlines all the time. Tuesday and Thursday, Tuesday and Thursday, and you have to do it really a lot of things, and that's what you're doing. Of course, it's tricky. I didn't, I didn't fight that. I'm giving there, say, okay, we'll go last thing. Well, actually, that's good that you brought that up, because I think another one of the issues or concerns, I mean, I don't know, for this summer was that there were more offers, so people could sign up for more things. Yeah. Which, you and know. And some of them would write to me and say, oh, I'm sorry, that looks so interesting, but I, I cannot spend so much time doing this, and I have time for another one, but I don't need so much time. I said, okay, thank you for telling me. But it was so like, oh my God, if I have to just stay by myself, because I just want to give the course as intense and, you know, substantial, maybe it's not the same thing. Maybe or either I just try to say, okay, we'll do the same in my time, but then what happens with the same course when you teach it face to face in the in the spring and in the fall. Don't be you know, you don't need that paper to do to do that. What you need is the same course online. Mm -hmm. Let's say okay, you know what to do it, take it <laughs> take it online on summer because you know you just have yeah. to do half of the stuff. Yeah. I don't put that on my soul. So, you know, I don't think that's our job. I think the same way students uh, face to face in the fall, the yeah. sixteen weeks know you don't sign up with ten courses. It's not possible. Yeah. They're just yeah. going to have to learn as online gets more familiar to them. They're going to have yeah. to learn 10, 3, yeah. and 4. Yeah. I think that's kind of one of the biggest issues that I see. And it, we talked about accessibility. They have so much access to education all the time and opportunity that they have a hard time limiting themselves. And that's one, now that I've been teaching this for a while, I see that they, because, they, because it's accessible, they think they can take it, mm -hmm. and that's the downside um, that I see in it. Um, and when they see that the when you have a hybrid and you require them to come a certain amount of times, I think they some students might almost take it into consideration a little bit more about the time because it there's something there that they have to you know they have to show up and they have to be present. I'd like to do more hybrid than just online, um, put summers online works, but I was interested that you said that about second session. I taught the same course, session one and session two. I could not believe how many students in session two signed up for the course, then dropped or stayed enrolled yeah. in the course, but have not submitted their work, have not done anything. They want me to extend the, the deadline. And I, yeah. I, I have uh, at least four students who said, well, I have this and this and this to do. And I said, well, I mean, you should have thought about that before you enrolled in the class. There's nothing I can do, but first summer session, I never have that problem. I think students are still in some mindset and they're ready to work and keep going, but then come second. I, and I, I think always having everything accessible never gives anyone that break in that mind that they can walk away from everything. So you got to consume, i got to consume, and then I get filtered and watered down and not being all that important. And also the perception that, you know, anything that's nice is kind of watered down and one of the things that we got a couple of times was, this is as much work as like a three class. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. And for us, it's a little more. Yeah. 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 As if we, you know, have, and so, well, it's that exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but because we have to say, you know, have to sit on the side Yeah. Something that I would like to know your opinions on, like experts in the movement towards online. I see in the, in the student body, like, it's kind of getting worse and worse the way that they are interacting, you know, they send emails without any sort of salutation or closing, it's like they're texting you, you know, you and your professor and you're your adult. And it's just, well, I want to do this, so why not? <laughs> and I'm worried that 
you know, the university here and then also in general moving towards a sort of online heavy or hybrid heavy teaching model is really playing into all of these things that are affecting this generation that's coming up. Um, you know, having it very heavy on discussion boards where they're very comfortable in that medium, commenting on things mm -hmm. anonymously, what well, even though it's not anonymous, but thinking that, you know, their own opinions are, are justified and, and, and they're correct, and I can just say this, and I know that I, I'm right. Um, and then the chatting and, you know, and having access to information constantly on their phones and their feeds and whatnot, but they're not really processing it. And I think that one of the most important parts is getting a liberal arts education. You know, we're, we're in charge of teaching these students and giving them knowledge, but also helping them grow into be people and learning how to be people. And the traditional classroom is you must show up on time, you must be presentable, you must be, you know, respectful to your professor and to your peers. And there's this sort of, you know, this university structure is very important. And I worry that moving towards this online medium, while it is very, it lends itself to the generation that's coming up, is it necessarily the best direction for higher education to go in? I mean, as an expert, I don't want to sound like a technical, no. a little bit, uh -uh. But, but, I, but I do worry that that real essential, like liberal arts education component is going to be lost. Um, I do see the students as kind of, you know, they're really teetering off as far as like how they think they're supposed to interact with them in the real world. And I just like to add something and then do other ones. So the difference between information and knowledge. So it's not the same knowledge and information and uh, nowadays completely mixed up. So information you can just get it, you know, with your mm -hmm. people nowadays, one is not enough. You know. But knowledge, this is something that is much more deep and you have to be, you know, the university traditionally has been the place to acquire knowledge. It's mm -hmm. not the same. Mm -hmm. It's not the same. Knowledge is something that you need full process to get, you know, into things and you know, analyze them and so on. Information. So I don't think the students even realize there is a big difference between the two. And when they tell them they go, Oh right, yeah. So, you know, that's something that we to say about now. So I have I, oh, check it out. I was just gonna say I have a, just a small little piece in the sure. Sure. Okay. Um, you mentioned, you know, the etiquette as far as you teaching yeah. teaching them how to be adults in the classroom, right? You know, really you know, ground rules, um, courteous to one another, attire. I still think that feeds over into online. So even if you're doing asynchronous or synchronous, I mean, you still have to be courteous to your professor and to your and respectful to your um, other students in the classroom, right? So you still have to set those same ground rules, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable um, in that online space. And so. I mean, that's still going to fall back on that professor to set those same kind of ground rules. So instead of thinking online is one way and face-to-face -face is one way, think about what do I do in face-to-face -face and how do I bring that into online? How do I set those ground rules? And if you do a synchronous session, same thing. I mean, everyone's got to wear a shirt. Guys, you can't show up shirtless. You still need to set your ground rules to teach them because even when they go in the workforce, they still can't do a meeting in whatever they feel like wearing, you know? So you still have to teach them some of those ground rules that you still would do in your face-to-face. So my, coming from class, my syllabus has a, there's a special etiquette and all the things that you think you don't have to say, it says it right there and I'm over it on Thursday. Mm -hmm. Like, like you say, you greet, be respectful, don't yeah. take the whole word, why oh you? And everything right there. Formal yeah. versus informal language. Yeah. And I think that I agree with you that there's a, mm -hmm. a movement towards more formality, but at the same time, one of the things that we're responsible for, and I think that in the AU, uh, there, was a, there was a document that was put out, and I can't recall right now the exact name of it, but there's like 10 things that we are sort of striving to do, and one of those things is digital. <laughs> well, no, 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 this is a list that has to do with. Uh, with the teaching and learning and how we interact with students and what I think like the second or third thing is like digital literacy and civility, civics. You know, so all of this is kind of like wrapped up in there and of course there's like, like you know, you were pointing out, there's different the things to kind of like bring that uh, equation in an uh, online environment. I, I do agree with you that there's certain things that, you know, can only be addressed uh, face to face, but you know, I don't think that it's necessarily that it's going to be lost completely necessarily.
I guess I take like a completely uh, different, I view it from a different paradigm where I guess I'm, I'm a pretty hardcore constructivist. So I, I'd like to look at why we feel it's necessary to speak, I guess, correctly or what the version of correct is and what we gain from, I guess, uh, making sure our students speak a certain way versus not another way or, or why do we care and figure that out before we put, um, an assessment value on that. So if you really feel that part of your course outcomes is to make sure that your students can write uh, very formal, well-written sentences, by all means, you know, put that into your assessment, make, you know, uh, different activities where you can have that as part of the rubric. If it's not part of something that you find interesting, if you're focusing more on a different aspect of their learning, like being able to uh, being able to step outside their comfort zone to, to say a thought, which is something that you'd want to maybe be done anonymously in one of those more um, personalized options, maybe that they shouldn't be worried about uh, spelling out the whole word Y-O-U and can just feel comfortable using you because you're making a, a safer space for them to describe in their own language uh, what they'd like to describe. Um, so I guess just keeping keeping the pulse or the feeling your own temperature about what's making, what's irking you about it, and if it's truly something that's part of the, the class that you'd want to make sure that their lives are somewhat enhanced by it. And knowing that a lot of their business communications do, you know, take, quote, take place over email. So when you do have those practice components, and if you want to say that like, uh, a, a mock or a simulation of a, an activity where they'd be speaking to their boss if they uh, saw that their boss was doing something that would be considered harassment and the, the simulation is how would you approach your boss via email or if your boss sent you this email how would you reply or if you saw uh, something happening and you needed to make an online complaint and then that could be an area for, for your assessment of, of this is actually not how one would actually go about this. Uh, as an HR representative, I would do X, Y, and Z. So there's a really good um, way to do some authentic activities of what happens out in the real world that you can kind of practice those skills. I think we're a little biased because in the language professors we're dealing with advocacy and grammatical all the time. Right. So for us, it's a little bit hard. I just kind of want to be there and say, like, stop. It's not mm -hmm. practices, you know, that way. Right. You know, and then also, I, mean, I do think it's important that these 18 year olds can sit in classrooms for an hour and 15 minutes. And they have to have undivided attention. I know attention span 20 minutes, but you know you can move to an activity, you can to lecture and back without checking the Facebook or, or whatnot. Like I don't allow any laptops in my classroom. So, so phones are not on the table from nowhere. Because they don't know how to, you know, speak French, so they don't need, they can't write it. They can't type it for sure, you know. Um, and and you know, and it's really hard for them. It's really really hard for them to be present and involved and implicate it for one hour. So I think where I say everybody's name, and they never know when they're going to get called on. Yeah. Or, or. And I think that the online teaching, you know, is great for certain people who are, you know, non traditional students, people who are overseas, people who are professionals who need, you know, the, the work people come and getting this degree for whatever reason that they need to get it. Mm -hmm. um, or have to work full time and can't make it class at 2.30 on a, on a Monday, you know? But, but the general undergraduate experience for the general AU student who doesn't have a full time job and, you know, and is living on campus and whatnot, like I just, I do feel like it's important that we still can maintain. I'm wondering how to translate it into an online situation where they're still implicated. I mean, yeah, they're acquiring knowledge as opposed to just bits of information. Because they read a million things a day, they're reading constantly, you know, but are they really absorbing anything? That's my is, is there a preparation class for students who come to AU to take an online? We have a Blackboard site. They are automatically enrolled into when they take an online course with some documents about how to be successful, how to be mature, how to take the course, what is an asynchronous course. You won't believe how many people sign up for online courses and they don't even know what asynchronous means. About one third of them actually get in there and look at it. I can't tell from the data whether they spend much time mm -hmm. or whether they just leave the document open for a while and then close it later and how much knowledge they get out of it. Laura? 
Laura and I also did a session just before the first summer session, uh, or actually Laura did it, I wasn't there. <laughs> uh, and some students came and they had these basic questions about the course and I think we need to be doing a better job of that at AU and we've been trying to reach out to the Writing Center and set up a process with the Writing Center for helping online students, which they never did before. Disabled students, what is happening with them? How are we working to help disabled students? And so I think we really need to work hard on it because I spend the first week teaching people how to take an online course and this is something they need to come in knowing and you know maybe we should have some students who could only take online, only take hybrids, only take face to face or maybe you should take a hybrid before you take online. There are different strategies for teaching undergrads where you have lots of smaller assignments and lots of touches versus graduate students. We looked at some data for AU courses face-to-face -face versus online. The grades in online were about one grade lower. That is, if the average at AU was a B plus because of our grade inflation, it was an average of B online. The rates of, say, administrative withdrawals, W's and F's were three to four times higher, in part because it's so short and they realize the fourth week they haven't done anything, they're dead. <laughs> so to have any success at this point, you know, with all the training we give you, they have to be trained so that this is a marriage made in heaven and not in hell. Uh, you had a comment, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, because I'm kind of close to the internet generation. So I was just saying, um, like, I totally agree that part of an education is to train somebody to be a human and to like, interact with other people. Um, but I think that today, part of being a human is also interacting online because so much stuff happens. Um, like even a lot of academic things happen online. Like there was a famous the math problem the, or computer science problem of uh, P equals NP, which is just whether extremely complex procedures can be condensed into very simple things. And so they put it on a form online and just have people try to sort out a proof of uh, whether uh, it can work or can't. And um, I think education should be, uh, like I think if we fight bringing things to an online environment because of this etiquette instead of trying to participate in shaping how people learn how to behave online, we're sort of reinforcing the idea that in interpersonal uh, physical interactions are a completely separate world from kind of what happens online, even though a lot of things are starting, even sophisticated academic things are starting to, to turn in that direction. Right, and along those lines, Courtney, you know, I just was listening to this podcast a couple days ago where there's like this huge um, undertaking on the linguistic community to start uh, actually studying texting and, you know, the language of texting, which is now you know, people didn't take it seriously and others like whole conferences. So they're talking precisely about that transition and where does that virtual um, arena end and, you know, the, the real physical um, interactions begin and how it's actually for a lot of people now that the, their perception is that it's, there's a seamless continuity between the two of them. So well, it's, I, I guess, like different love perceptions. <laughs> but I, you know, the whole completely yeah, for everything. Right here. Yeah, I think I it's like a matter of complexity, and you know, there's like different, it's different things that have uh, more things now that we have to address in four years. I really think that it's an actual challenge that we should uh, address that our content has to be more interesting for students than the click away to the to Facebook. <laughs> yeah. No, no, it worries me what you're saying. My idea is that they have, sorry, but I mean, <laughs> you know, I have a question of information, and I know exactly what you're saying, and I nothing against anything, you see, but <laughs> really, it's us trying harder and harder to reach out of them, and they're just being, you know, and they're just, okay, you know, poor thing, we have to try harder, so we make ourselves more, everything more interesting, mm -hmm. otherwise we lose them. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's very interesting. Really? Because we don't know what it means. We're entertainers. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Sorry? We become entertainers. Yeah. yeah. Mm. 
and you know, let's do it a bit easier because otherwise they won't get it. And let's do it, you know, try to make things that what I'm saying is that, you know, I still believe that we have as human beings, we can concentrate on one thing for an hour and go in bed, forget all the rest of the world, and that's something that we are losing. And losing this is dangerous. You see, the paradox about what he talked about, the people in the problem, that's an unsolvable math problem. So for people who get involved in that, th these are people who are already in the stratosphere. They're like artists because this is yeah. a math problem. That yeah. cannot, I don't know if you all know the, the problem, but it's, it's regarded as being essentially an unsolvable math problem. It hasn't, so people who engage in that world, it, it's like quantum physics. I mean, well, beyond that in a way. It, that space is, is like the space of abstract art or avant-garde music, I, I would say. It, it almost doesn't matter because the people who engage in it are rarefied few and, and they already respect each other. In the very same way that you want to preserve, anybody who can enter that world already respects the five other people mm -hmm. on the earth who can enter <laughs> that world. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So you've given us a... I would say a sort of a bad example. I mean, I, I like that you said what you said because the issue of this, this distinction. See, see, from another point of view, uh, there are whole segments of society, people who've been excluded, and so they have to master the etiquette of being able to go into. And I, it's amazing that I'm saying this, but to go into the corporate world, go into certain spaces, and be perceived as belonging. Mm -hmm. which uh, bothers me for a lot of other reasons which I will not get into. But, uh, uh, and, and so if you can enter this people and people, nobody cares what you're wearing <laughs> and because to be there means you be, it's like being with the best musicians or the best mathematicians or the best this or the, you know, nobody care what Picasso wore. <laughs> Or who we dated. Which is not a good thing necessarily. But so I think you're right. Yeah, you're right. I think you're right. There is an issue what people walk away with in terms of being able to navigate all the world. I mean, very honestly, I don't think you can solve that just by giving guidelines for your own course. You see, in my course, you treat me like or whatever, because I'm just a conversation with common only. That's not the case, you see. I think it's more far more <coughs> on the spot, deeper think on the further. Think about this harder. Yeah, I think it's actually a matter of giving them guidelines how to behave or how to drive. Mm -hmm. so I think that's something which is more epistemological. Mm -hmm. Has anybody been a member of some sort of a specialized forum, like anybody that's been interested in knitting or electronics or seen any of those whenever you've had a question online, like how do I fix my sprinkler? And you see people really getting in and forming these communities around knowledge that isn't necessarily academic, but it's, it's interesting to see how much attention and how much um, community is built online in these spaces. Mm -hmm. So you know that it can happen. And I want to know more about those awesome like discussion boards and how you're able to craft that experience versus something that just falls flat and is surface. You know? Yeah. I think so I kind of like going back bringing back to what you were saying, that there's like that danger that we have to kind of like pull out like the whole, you know, dancing girls and the elephants and you know <laughs> symbols. But there's also, I mean, in my experience uh, there's a lot of creativity out there, and I think you let them go with some alternative assignments. People tend to kind of like shine, and they get like so excited mm -hmm. that you get excited, and you're like, okay, great, we're going to move along with that. And I found that in some of my classes, you know, when I give them something slightly different to do, and they kind of grab onto that. You just can see that little glimmer in their eyes, and it's just like so rewarding, so amazing. Uh, so I think it goes both ways. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's, it's an interesting, maybe it's just because personal bias, but I mean, I think that, you know, online coverage is important and we're moving there, so we got to move there. So I just think it's important mm -hmm. that we think about yes. how we can yes. preserve, yes. you exactly. know, the actual academic experience in the online form. Mm -hmm. When I was doing the online training for hybrid, I had tabs open 
know, I'm, I'm on the email, I'm like continuing to do my work. Yeah, but then you have to do some stuff like the recordings, which actually was, I think like, that's one of my favorite well, examples. Well, horrified. Yeah. <laughs> I know, but I think I did, you know, rather than having you do what ways where you tell me I did this and this and this, like I thought when you were kind of comparing those two articles and you would tell me what you thought about them, right. that's something that you can't take. I mean, mm -hmm. I could really see that you had read and you had processed. Right. And that actually was one of my goals. When I saw that you were able to do that, I said, okay, now she understands that I do this, 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 and this. Right. And I do the same thing with my students in class. I mean, like, you know, and then I, I get back and give them, I don't give a lot of feedback because otherwise I would be there like 24 hours, like Nuria, <laughs> but, you know, I. I kind of try to give them like very punctual things, you know, say so, like, oh, did you notice you were playing with your hair? You know, do you notice what's behind you when you're taping yourself? You know, make sure that your underwear is not like <laughs> <laughs> on top of a, of a counter in the back, you know, that sort of thing, because you need to know this will work, because at some point you're going to be doing a teleconference from your office, and so you're going to have to kind of go around and like, be aware of these things, you know, and then, you know, for people who don't have those issues, then it's like, oh, check out the lightning, or, you know, like, you can do this more interesting by setting on the side of the screen. That sort of thing, you know? But I mean, sometimes it doesn't even matter because people are like, so involved in what they're doing in, in the assignment that it, it's immaterial. You kind of really get into their story or their perception or their uh, you said, like, interpretation of what it is that they're doing. So there's, there, there's that as well. So there's like, an opportunity, I think. There's some opportunities that are afforded to us to sort of like get that, get that so we're coming up on our end time, and I wanted to maybe wrap up by asking each one of you, and if anybody else wants to share, um, what advice you'd have for somebody interested in creating a hybrid class. Jim? Can I go off topic a little? Sure. <laughs> you know, this is not the first time human beings have had this debate about how technology changes how we learn. And four and five thousand years ago, the ancient Greeks and other ancient peoples, as they were developing written communications and moving from an oral to a written tradition, there were people who were saying, that's the end of education. They're going to be reading from these marks written on a stone tablet uh, and we're not going to be able to talk to our students anymore or take them out and show them things in the country. That's the end of education. And somehow we got through that and adapted, and now it's sort of ingrained in the human experience, this whole idea of reading. But that's something we had to learn. And so I think we're going to have to come to grips with how to learn how to educate ourselves and others in this new medium, and we're just getting started doing it. We have a long ways to go. Thank you. But any last thoughts or advice, Jen? Um, the devil is in the details. So <laughs> when you're laying on a hybrid or online course, and, um, as opposed to your face-to-face, -face, you can tell your student all the details. Mm -hmm. Now you don't have that luxury mm -hmm. so much, so you've got to really lay it on your Blackboard site, your syllabus, um, in your lecture. You, you need to make sure you give your students the details, or else they will bombard you with emails and questions about all of those details that they may have missed. Yeah. I like the idea of, like, you know, formative assessment. You know, you fall, dust yourself, and try again. You know, just be persistent. Uh, it's a lot about experimenting, I think, and I think that's what makes it so exciting in a way because you can like, try things out. So not everything's going to work, but some things are. Um, so I would say it's patience. Wonderful. Well, we'll be here for a few more minutes. And thank you all so much for coming today. And please get in touch if you'd like one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.